In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain Report is going to be continuing in the book of Samuel. And as you may recall from yesterday, Samuel has just found the king, or who is going to become the king at some point, because he's been ordered by God that he must find the person that is going to be king and anoint him, and then he will be the ruler over God's people in Israel. Samuel finds Saul, who is out there looking for his father's donkey, takes him, makes him a guest of honor, dines with him, and then upon the next day, this is the the scene that we sort of start our story on. This happens out in public, in the streets. And this is where our story begins in 1 Samuel 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took the flask of oil and poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? Now I know that that passage is significantly shorter than what we usually look at for our chaplain's reports. But the reason that I did that is because there are three very important truths that we can draw from this very, very short little passage of Scripture. Samuel coming to Saul, anointing his head with oil, crowning him essentially the king of Israel. First of all, the first major truth is that a prophet must be the one to do the anointing. You'll notice that the way that particular verse is written is, Has not the Lord anointed you? So yes, Samuel was the one physically picking up the flask of oil and pouring it over Saul's head. But ultimately what was going on there is that it was not Samuel, but the Lord who was anointing him. It was the Lord that instructed Samuel to do this. And the action that is given in that statement, the the attribution of who is doing the anointing, is not Samuel, it's God. Samuel is acting as an agent and an extension of God and God's will, which means that when it comes to the ruler of a nation, that the way that it's supposed to happen is that God's will is supposed to be the ultimate determining factor of what is going on here. And we know from other parts in Scripture that ultimately God is the one that bestows power to anybody that has it, that he is the source of all authority. And so even bad people that do obtain authority and obtain power, God allows them to have it that they don't take it by force. It's not something that they've gained because of what they've done, that ultimately all things do come from God. And we see that even Saul, even though he's not going to be a perfect king, he's going to do a lot of things that very much displease God in the future, that he is, for the time being, God's anointed, God's chosen. And so that's really interesting that in this process, God must be involved and it must be an extension of his will, which is the reason that a prophet must be the one to anoint Saul as the king. Second big truth, the king is the ruler over his inheritance. Well, now that's interesting because he says he's the Lord's anointed to rule over his inheritance. Well, in that sentence, that would mean that the inheritance would be God's people. The kingdom of Israel, the land, the people, everything, that's something that God refers to as his inheritance? Yes. And Saul is essentially a ruler over that inheritance. So the inheritance is God's. The people are God's. The land are God's. All of that is God's. And it has to be God's will that anoints a king into power that he gives him to be the ruler over it. So that kind of suggests... And then instead of a king, what is really going on here is that Saul is God's steward. He is the person that has been put in charge of taking care of what is God's. He's almost like a house sitter. He's somebody that, because God has, has this great nation of Israel, this people that he has purchased, he has brought them out of Egypt, they are his and his belonging, his called out. That because he owns them, and he needs someone to take care of them. And they've been begging for a king, and, and you know that story, we've already gone over that. That Saul is going to be the steward that takes care and watches over them. 
So that's another really important truth too, is that when we are given something, when God blesses us with something, even if it is something that is prestigious, even if it's something that people would envy, if it's some kind of great talent, or we have a lot of wealth, we have a big family, God gives us the gift of having a spouse, having children, a leadership position like an elder or a deacon, whatever it is, we have to keep in mind that we are essentially stewards. We are people that God has given charge of to take care of something that is ultimately his. We don't own it. We don't even own ourselves. If we're somebody that has given ourselves over to Christ to be washed in his blood and to have our sins forgiven, then we don't even own our own lives anymore. It's all his. And so whether we're even talking about something that is presumably ours, like our body, our house, our property, whatever it may be, it is ultimately merely something that God has imparted to us for a purpose and to do a job. We are taking care of something that is God's to make gain for him and to further the cause of his kingdom. That's what is going on here with Saul. God is telling Saul, these are my people. It is my inheritance. I am giving you rulership over them. Don't screw it up. That's essentially the message that is being conveyed to Saul here. The third big truth is that this process is not showy or grand, but it is necessary. You know, when we think of a coronation for a king, we look at, for example, the royal weddings and things that we see that happen in England. Uh, whenever you see a coronation, there's always this big to-do and everybody comes out and there's all these royal banners and the king's knights are there to show his military prowess and he's always dressed in these big fancy things. None of that happens here. None of it. All that happens is Samuel goes out into a street in some town, and he's not even in Jerusalem. He just walks out into the street of the little town that they're staying in, and then Samuel, or sorry, Saul kneels down, Samuel pours the oil over his head. That's it. Nothing super fancy. There are witnesses there, but, I mean, basically they didn't even call for a crowd. Just whoever happened to be in the vicinity at the time got to see it. I think that that was a message to Saul and something that the Lord was doing in an attempt to keep Saul humble. Now we see that as the years go on, that doesn't really stick with Saul. But I think there was a great deal of wisdom in God saying, this is how somebody becomes my steward, somebody becomes my anointed. There is a ceremony. There is a ceremony that is necessary, but it's relatively small in scale. It's not something that's old, grandiose. You're, you're not going to see you know, the Spirit of the Lord descending from the heavens and uh, thundering in a voice or something. It's really just very simple. And I think that that was something that was intended to impart some humility on Saul. And I think it's kind of something that we could draw a similarity to baptism. That it's not something that's super complicated. I mean, it could literally just be you out, out there in some random river or a swimming pool, any body of water that's big enough to submerge a human body. It doesn't have to be big or fancy. And that's because I think God knows that it's important for us to stay humble. And also because what he requires of us is not something that is hard to do. To do God's work is a great monumental task. But to become a servant of God and to become somebody that is a steward essentially over the things that are his, that's actually pretty simple. And I think there is a beauty and an elegance in that simplicity. But it was still something that needed to be done. For Saul to become king and to be ruler over God's people, it was still a necessity. It was still something Saul had to do. The fact that it was symbolic, the fact that it was something that was relatively uh, you know, not grandiose or, or not a big show or a, a big demonstration by human standards didn't detract from the fact that it needed to be done. That to be a person, to be in accordance with God's will, Saul had to be anointed. And I think what that does show to us is that the things that God asks us to do, they might be hard, but they're simple. And ultimately, as we learned from earlier in this passage, everything does ultimately belong to God. And it is only by God's will that we have those things.
just like Saul, we have an amazing responsibility to do what God wants us to do because we become his by a act of his own will. That's something we need to remember and need to live our lives accordingly. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.